Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Chris Georginis, uh, and we're talking about the survival guide for gigging drummers. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. All right. So let's, um, before we start, uh, maybe kind of tell people about yourself and, uh, you know, what made you kind of acquire these tips and tricks along the way. Um, and uh, let's start there and then we'll get into the actual, you know, the survival guide. So so tell us about yourself. Cool. Well, born and raised in Boston, played, started playing drums when I was about nine or 10 years old. Just fell in love with the instrument. Um, took a few lessons here and there, but it, uh, for the most part, kind of self-taught. I wished I took more lessons, but that's a whole other side story. Uh, but I just learned by listening, playing with friends and starting bands in high school and things like that. Um, ended up actually going to an art school after high school. My actually, actually high school didn't even offer art or music. It was one of those schools that just at the time didn't offer any of it. So once I finally got out of high school, I went to an art school of all places. So um, I thought maybe a music school, but my parents pushed me to do art. I'm glad they did. At the time, I wasn't sure, but it came out uh, with a BFA. And this was back before the internet, back before social media. So it was really hard to not only market yourself, but even find a job. I got lucky a few years out of college, but it was mainly because I was in a band. I started um, an original rock band in Boston with uh, as a trio, and we were gigging a ton all the time. And I've been gigging since I was in high school. So, and I'm still probably gigging more now than ever. And uh, so it's, you know, whatever, a few decades of, of gigging. Um, but the big band I had in the 90s, it was my guitarist girlfriend who said, uh, hey, I have a friend who's an animator for a show that's being produced in the Boston area that's on Comedy Central. It's a show called Dr. Katz. Mm -hmm. And I had just seen previews for it. And I said, how on earth is that being done here? Like, I didn't think shows, animated shows are being done in Boston. So I submitted, I had to dust off my portfolio. I brought it there Monday morning. I dropped it off. I said, I'll be back Friday to pick it up. I uh, didn't even bother trying to get an interview or, or going through all of that. And um, I went back Friday to pick it up and the art director came upstairs, showed me where they were producing the show. And long story short, a month later, I got hired to work on a pilot for Steven Spielberg's new company at the time because he noticed the show, Dr. Katz. Hmm. So here I am playing in a band, working part time at my father's restaurant. I'm making no money. I'm in debt. And the first real big boy job that I got was um, working on what was DreamWorks, the beginning of DreamWorks. We did a pilot wow. for DreamWorks. And um, I mean, I had other jobs. I was a mechanic for a while uh, at a car dealership and things like that. But I was still, I wasn't making any money for the most part. And then I get this real job. And so I always thought, all right, I'm going to do art and music and whichever one takes off is the one I'm going to keep pursuing. And they both were kind of just neck and neck all my life. So I've been like constantly... Sure doing both and it's at times they overlap even during the pandemic i was doing a lot of remote um collaborations with musicians from boston to italy and and wherever else even one musician out in um australia collaborated with us so cool it's been a wild ride it's been a crazy journey but i'm still you know doing both full-time during the day animator monday through friday working for you know, over the years, it's been game companies, it's been creative agencies, ad agencies. Now I'm working for a startup in the rare disease healthcare space doing their visual storytelling. So wow, just even the art side of things has been crazy, amazing and challenging. And music side of things, it's always been, you know, a persistent aspect to my life. I've been in bands all my life. I'm in um, mostly cover bands now uh, that are busy with playing two, three gigs a weekend. So, uh, yeah, That's animating awesome. by day and, and gigging by night. So yeah, I can't complain. Life has been fun. Yeah, man. I mean, I think they're so like on paper, they're not related animating drumming, but they are really, it's the same creative part of your brain. And I think like growing up means you kind of have to make some decisions where you have a stable job, but like. I mean, you're an animator. That's one of the coolest jobs you could have. It, well, the interesting thing about, um, you know, animation or music, they do overlap in ways I never thought. Um, so, for instance, when I was working at the company where I was doing Dr. Katz, the animation director was also a guitarist. Uh, Andre Lyman is his name. And he said to me one day, he says, musicians usually make really good video editors because they have a good sense of time. And so sure. one day I walked in and he put me down uh, behind the an avid media composer, full video editing suite. And he says, 
and there was uh, we were editing. T- they were editing together uh, one of the episodes for Doctor Katz. He says, "Do this whole bar scene. Just edit it together with the existing animated footage." And then he went to lunch and he came back an hour later and watched it. And he's like, yep, I had a feeling you'd be good at this, especially being a drummer with the sense of rhythm. He says, you have the same sense of rhythm visually. So sometimes they do go hand in hand, which is, yeah. I, even I was kind of surprised. I wasn't sure if he was going to like anything I did. And then, so that got me hooked on the whole video editing thing as well. And just the whole visual storytelling aspect. So you're being creative as an animator visually. And then, you know, sonically as a drummer or a musician yeah. of any kind, it's it, in a way it's, they're different, but the same. It's, it's, weird but fun yeah i would agree completely all right chris jumping into the survival guide for gigging drummers which again i think is a super cool topic it's just some things where i mean we've all been in that situation playing gigs where like you i don't know the like you're missing like the wing nuts from your symbols and you can't keep it on or like it's falling off or you forget your throne or you don't have an extra head you don't have an extra snare um all kinds of stuff so take us through the survival guide for gigging drummers all right, so I've seen it all since I've been gigging for so long. I'm a middle-aged man. I'm I'm gigging more than ever, and I, I feel blessed and lucky for that. But talking recently with my friend Katie O'Brien, who I also gig with, she has a great band, but uh, we were just going back and forth about must-haves or cool things. Like one day she said she brought sandwiches for the whole band, and that was a huge bonding moment. I thought, you, not only that, but there's a certain way to make sandwiches that survive a, a long gigging trip, you know? <laughs> So we just started going back and forth and and we both looked at each other like we should start, we should somehow document this, whether it's we start our own podcasters, but we never hear anybody really talk about the ins and outs. And that's how this topic kind of was born, at least why I presented it to you. Um, sure. So I'm glad you took me up on it. Um, and also just because I, I, I get a lot of calls almost weekly, if not sometimes even daily from other bands that need a drummer. Uh, and a lot of it are repeat bands that I've gigged with. And I started thinking like, all right, what is it? Why is it me? Why am I the guy that is always getting that call every week? And, and I always feel lucky. But one of the big things is, is when someone does text or email me saying, hey, I need, I need a drummer, I always respond right away, even if I don't know if I can do it yet. Because I, I know that they're not just sending me that. I'm not the only person getting that text. Sure. I'm sure they're doing a whole blanket text to five or ten drummers um and they're just because they're probably usually they're in a bind they have a day or two before they need to find a drummer they're they're stuck maybe a lot of times like most recently a lot of drummers a lot of bands i know their drummer got covid and they have three days and they have two or three gigs that weekend and they they need someone so i always at least respond right away i'm done checking my calendar right now i'll get get back to you as asap yeah um and i always keep my google calendar updated so i can check on the phone if i'm not home in front of a desktop um but yeah, that's the first thing is respond quickly. Let them know if you can or you can't. And even if you can't, I'll even offer to help them find somebody, um, which goes a long way sometimes. And I've done that for uh, a couple of bands. I've, I've located, I know a lot of great drummers and I've I've connected them with a drummer that they still continue to use this day, which is, yeah. which, which goes a long way, right? It's good well, kind of PR. You only get asked uh a couple times and then if 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 you are messing it up and not answering or if every single time they ask and you have you keep saying no you're going to be off the list right exactly so they won't even bother next time you won't be one of the first people they think of exactly um the next big tip was kind of the i mean it might sound basic but just even having a reliable car i've seen musicians you know an hour or two before the gig say, oh, my car broke down or I got a flat tire or I don't have a car or something. Or, I need a ride or something like that. It's just if you can't get yourself to a gig, um, that's a huge blemish on your on your record. Uh, yeah. And the other thing is it's obviously going to be a reliable. But here's something that happened to me this past Saturday night, making sure like everything is working on on your car. I got out of a I had three gigs this weekend, two on Saturday, Saturday night. We're done with the last gig. I'm loaded up, ready to leave. I'm, I'm down on Cape Cod. I've got, you know, whatever, an hour and a half drive. And one of my headlights is out. And I mm. thought, oh, and I'm particular about making sure everything's working. Sure. And I even polished my headlights uh, like a <laughs> month ago because it's a 13-year-old car, right? And the headlights yeah. are all dull. And, and you never know driving home at 2 o'clock in the morning when that deer crosses the road in yeah. front of you. So having, you know, bright visibility, it's, it's, I, you can't help but think about things like that. Yeah. Um, and sure enough, uh, within like five miles, I got pulled over 
and the cop was super nice he saw wow. all the gear in the car he's like hey what you know what where were you gigging and uh he's like you know you have a headlight out and i'm like yep and you know he was fine verbal warning let me go and the lights was fixed as of yesterday but that's a, like a, one of those little things well i'm on that i want to throw out that like it's at gigs in my experience uh in my younger days it's very easy to have a bar tab and you know everyone has different situations but like I mean, if there's everyone's got free beer flowing or whatever you're into, if you don't drink whatever, that's fine. But like uh, I would partake in, you know, drinking beers at the gig. And then if you're driving home, which you should never do very bad. Yeah. But if you have a headlight out, it's just a terrible situation to put yourself in. You're going to get pulled over. Even my guitarist called it. He's like, you're getting pulled over tonight. I said, nah, I'll be fine. I haven't been pulled over in years. And sure enough, he was right within five miles. Yeah. The other thing is, bring even if you don't drink, we, there's a couple of guys in the band that don't drink. But sometimes, if if crowds get rowdy, they can spill a drink on you, and then you're then you smell like alcohol in getting pulled over. And then you know, of course, if they do a breathalyzer, they're not gonna they're gonna see it. They're gonna you're gonna prove to them you have nothing in your system. But I always bring an overnight bag, even if I'm not staying overnight, just to change. Some you don't want to be sitting in a car with sweaty clothes either. Um, yeah. So having a change of clothes is good. My car is a Honda Fit. And I bought it specifically for gigging because it fits literally everything. And then some, I always keep a backup hi-hat stand uh, underneath the, the seats, a backup pedal that's just all, it just lives in the car, all these things. And I even have um, bungeed to the ceiling on the inside of the car are extra drum heads. So, and that stuff <laughs> just, awesome. it never, it never leaves the car. And I've never had to use them, but I do know for a fact that if, if for whatever reason I get to a gig without any of that stuff, that's when my hi hat pedal and break all my drum heads will happen. It yep. just, it's going to happen. Murphy's yep. law. There's something like I don't know. It, it's like you, sometimes you don't want to put the money into buying a pedal or something like that. But like even like behind yeah. me now, I have an Aquarian Super Kick Two head in the box that's been sitting there for two years because I mean I don't break bass drum heads that often, and it's like but yeah, I just very I know I know that it's there. And if sometimes we'll play a gig, we don't go until 10 o'clock at night and we're out in like Wellfleet on the Cape and there's not, there's no one around. There's not even cell service. And in that one time you break a drum head, like a, especially a kick head, um, that's it gigs over. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it, if it's the first song or the third song or the first set even. So I actually have an Aquarian, I think it's a 10 inch patch too, that lives in my cymbal oh, cool. bag, which is always right next to me. So if I do break a head, I can at least in between songs, see if the patch will work, get me through the set, and then I'll go out to the car, grab a new batter mm. head and throw that on. So I feel like wow. I have that covered. Yeah, I've been, I've, I've been to clubs where another band is playing. I remember this um, clearly because it was a young band and they were great. And I think it was like halfway through the night, the drummer broke his snare batter head. Mm-hmm. And because he started playing the tom as a snare and i then i looked over and i noticed it was broken so i was just watching him in between songs and he took his snare and he flipped it upside down and started playing the rezo head which you can't play you have to not be good very delicate not good yeah and he had to play the whole night like that because he didn't yeah. have extra heads he didn't have a backup snare and i thought oh my god you have to at least have a backup snare yeah you have to be able to no one's going to sit there and watch you between songs you know, the whole band watch you change an entire head out. Just have a backup. Bring two snares, at least two no. snares. We've all seen the videos of like huge drummers or something like with a drum tech where like they break a snare and the drum tech like whoosh, 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 they like hand it yeah. off and they change it exactly. like like a like a pit crew. I mean, it's like an instant yep. change um, that feeling. And it seems like it it only happens. I've done it a few times at gigs where you're playing that feeling of of you hit your bass drum pedal down. Something's not right punched right through the head and it's just a distinct horrible feeling and i've had that thought Mm -hmm. i think in my you know in like high school or something flip the bass drum head around i don't think the bass drum head had a port on it that i was doing but like play the front head and it's like and then the front heads you can probably get through a gig for a little bit but then your front head is ruined and you've got like a right tama logo on it or whatever and then now you're out 125 dollars and and heads exactly Yeah, I actually had a gig recently where the well, something broke on the bass drum pedal, but it was a slow process. So I could feel it getting sloshy. Um, but so I got through the rest of the set and then yeah, was just able to run to the car and grab that backup pedal. And, you know, you don't have to spend it's not you don't have to you don't need a Pearl Demon drive or mm-hmm. whatever pedal to you don't have to spend three, four hundred dollars. I bought like a sixty dollar pedal 
at a secondhand store up the street. It's a solid pedal. It's a great feeling pedal. Sure. Um, or like an old DW5000 or 3000, just something to get you through yeah. 10 songs even or the whatever yeah. whatever it takes. I even got to a gig once. This is funny. Right before the gig, I'm loading up my hardware bag and I noticed a little like coupler, right? A coupler, threaded coupler. And I thought like, what? I, maybe that's from just one of those little boom arm symbol bracket things. And yep. I took it out of the bottom of the bag and I just, I, I cast it aside, get to the gig, setting everything up we're in the middle of nowhere uh this beachcomber out in wellfleet you know and it's it's crazy and it's fun and it's a blast but we have you know a quick setup time quick sound check and doors open and then you're playing for three hours i go to connect the top rod to my hi-hat and it's just not threading i'm like why is this thing not catching on it and i realized that coupler belonged inside the hi-hat to couple the top yeah. rod with the now i have no hi-hat <laughs> and this was back when i when i didn't have a second I didn't bring a backup hi hat stand. This is the reason why I still I do it today. Jeez. Um, so I ended up finding a little threaded nut. Was able to get two or so threads, uh, the the nut on it, and the the rod, uh, two or three threads on that. And then I took um, gaffer's tape and just made like a golf ball size ball around it and yep. got it to at least work. And I just was really gentle about playing the hi hat that. Yeah, night. no, you're not like um, doing. Uh, crazy hi-hat work the entire time i'm sure that night no Man. but i do but i do like when i'm say on the ride that my left foot does keep those quarter yeah. notes going and sometimes i'm stomping on it but that mm -hmm. night i was mental you know mentally prepared to just easy on the hi-hat i actually played better I actually, instead of just trying to wail on the hi-hat but i just be i played more relaxed um the other yeah. thing what happened too, same same gig not maybe same venue but a different gig the pedal linkage on the hi-hat broke down where the pedal is um and it was just like broken beyond repair i had now mm -hmm. since bought replacements uh replacement chain linkage it's actually a strap drive um and i bought two one to fix it and one to keep in my little tool bag that i keep on every gig and but to get through that night i i started i had to be a macgyver of sorts and i, I started thinking i need a way to link this stuff together um and i asked the band and the sound guy i'm like does anyone have zip ties and my keyboardist said oh i do out in the van smart and he and he came back with a big thing of like zip ties you know like like they were at least a foot long the kinds where like the fbi yeah. yeah like when they <laughs> detain people and at yeah. first I, I started thinking like dude what are you doing with these zip ties in your van but yeah. he, he's he's it was a little creepy, but he's not like that at all. But I'm <laughs> just oh, so thankful he had him. It took like six zip ties to create this linkage that got me through the night. Now I keep wow. zip ties in the car. I know. You know, I know that that's drum stuff is interesting like that, where uh, it's not basic, but it's like it's it's really technologically advanced stuff. But we're not dealing with like, um, so, you know, you're not soldering stuff on the fly. You can put it together. Uh, yeah with like with limited toy style exactly yeah yeah pretty yeah. neat and i'm sure this is on your your list but gaff tape gaffers tape is just an essential for um everything for production yeah. life with video and audio for gigging for around your house it's not cheap it's pretty expensive it's like 20 something bucks a roll but um right that is essential right. or even um gorilla tape is mm -hmm. good it's cheaper it's yep. actually probably it's a lot stronger Yep. Um, you know what's really good to have too are those multi-purpose tools specifically for drummers that have all the Allen wrenches, all those yep. sizes. It has um, a drum key style um, tool. It has a uh, Phillips head, flat head, uh, everything you could possibly need. Now I'm finding like I play a Dixon pedal, bass drum pedal. It has an L-shaped drum key in it with an Allen wrench on the other end and then two additional Allen wrenches all built into the base of the pedal. So you have it always right there, which I thought was like really cool. Tama wow. makes a great multi-purpose tool. What's great about it is you ever have like tightened a wing nut too tight on your hardware and you can't get it undone. It has a little slot on the side of its tool that you put the drum key into and you use that as leverage. Yeah. And the other trick is the other trick is to use two drumsticks on either side of the. Of yeah, the, that's, right? it's that type of thing. That's the YouTube. Yeah. Uh, you see the thumbnails of like, you know, people doing it like uh, yeah, Stephen Taylor exactly. and R. David yes, R. and stuff. But <laughs> I've seen him do it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. and it, and it works. It works oh, yeah. really well. I love those yeah. drum hack things. How do you like that Dixon pedal? I've 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 never played one. Right. But it, 
Yeah. I, I was in I was in Nashville for the first time uh, in May. And there's a great drum store called Drum Supply down there. Andy Foote is the owner or manager of it. And I've been buying gear from him for years, over the years. And I said, hey, I'm going to be in Nashville. I'll stop by and visit. Now, separate story. There's a great builder. and I'm, I can't space. Uh, I'm spacing the name uh, of him. He's an independent drum builder on Instagram that I follow. And he's had years, a couple years ago, he built this beautiful kit, White Marine Pearl with custom inlays and da 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 so combine these two stories. I'm in Nashville. I, I finally get over to Drum Supply. I walk in. I see Andy Foote and say hi. And the place is like, it's like mini little Disney World for drummers. It's just great. He's got stuff. It's eye candy, right? It's like yep. sensory overload. You can't even <laughs> take it all in. It's, you have to spend a week there. Um, but I look over and, and set up on the floor is that drum kit, the white marine pearl with the cu custom inlays. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a one-off kit. This is amazing. This dr his builder is somewhere else. I don't know, even know where he, he is. But anyway. So he's like, yeah, try it out. Sit down and, and play it. I sat down, put my foot on the pedal, and I forgot about the drums. I mean, immediately. <laughs> That's wow. how good this pedal felt. It's a direct drive Dixon pedal. And I knew instinctively, I'm like, Andy, this is going to come home with me, this pedal. That's how much I loved it because Man. it was effortless to play the kick drum softly and just as effortlessly to lean in on it and get power out of it. It was one of those. It just felt perfect it like it was like one to one ratio with my foot and i huh. loved it and i've been playing with it ever since and dixon's great dixon i you know wanted to get like backup parts for it I, I messaged them on a friday night uh through instagram and they responded within minutes it's like who does that it's, it was yeah crazy. well but I, I, yeah. it goes it goes back to um tip number one respond fast on the survival guide <laughs> so dixon is doing that i've wanted to do an they episode are. about the company for a while because i mean i think of like Greg Bissonette playing them mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. it's they make beautiful drums and great pedals, obviously, but I don't know much about them. So I'd like to, to learn I was, more. So I was in the exactly I was in the same boat. Uh, they're not like, you know, the top five or six even drum manufacturers you think of, you know, mm -hmm. so it, but they're there and they're, yeah. they're they're doing great. They actually shipped me um, basically almost like a whole new pedal for free from Taiwan. It showed up like a week and a half later. Wow. Like great. Yeah. Customer service. I mean, I'm not even endorsed. It's like pff, yeah, incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. The other thing I like to keep in my car, uh, speaking while we're on the, the topic, is actually I keep lubricant in the car. Mm -hmm. um, like a, you know, whatever, even just a small like three in one oil or like blaster or something like that, because it'll happen if you're gigging. A lot of times my hardware bag won't even leave the car because it's too heavy. There's no reason. Um, sure. But you'll get to a gig and that not so much the pedal squeaking, but I've had hi-hat pedals squeak. And not that the audience will ever hear it, but it's really nice to know you can just squirt it with some lube and just be done and, and yeah. take care of it. That and even um, monkey wipes, I keep, you know, like like simple little things like that. When you get grease on your hands, if you're, do, if you're oh, fixing yeah. something. I, I've had even other bandmates get their fingers dirty because they were fixing something and they're like, oh, I got grease all over and I hand them one of those and they're like, yeah. dude, you have everything. Yeah. Yeah. So those are well, great to have. They're small little packets. We've all had it where you're like, or like someone who's not you is putting together your throne or whatever and they grab the base of the throne and they're covered then with grease or yeah. someone's wearing a white shirt and then you've ruined their shirt forever or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really smart. It's just these simple little like um, I will say that these you clearly have a personality type that like thinks about this. So I think maybe if people out there don't have that personality type or they're they're not quite like, you know, which I kind of I think I've kind of fallen both categories a little bit, which maybe a lot of people do, too, where you plan yeah. some things, other things you don't plan as much. But I mean, this is a good list to like it's it's actionable. Like, OK. Respond yeah, fast, easy. reliable car, change of clothes, gear in the car. Yeah. And also, you know, the biggest fear, and it's every gig, and no matter how prepared you are, is you'll get a mile from your house and you just start second guessing if you remembered your stick bag or if you remembered floor yeah. tom legs or something like that. So I actually have a list on my phone, just whatever the list app or reminder app is of all the things I desperately need. And I use that as a second check. Um, I'll even stand outside the car after it's all packed up and I'll go, all right, the first thing I put down is the rug. There it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the kick. Got it. Then I got the hardware bag for the snare stand. Snare. Got the snare. Uh, hi-hat symbols. Good. I can get through a gig with kick and snare and a hi-hat. But yeah. So everything else is easy. <laughs> I do play a, I do play a Roland 
SPDSX. So I got that. I do have XLR cable for that. I have an internal microphone for the kick, which oh, cool. is awesome. One of those like Kelly, a Kelly shoe mounts. Yeah. Yeah. And I have cool. that suspended. I have a little Audix D6 mic because they're small and lightweight and yeah. they sound great. And then I have a Michael May XLR port on the side. So, and I, I actually on on a, on a custom kit I do. I would never like drill through a nice Ludwig Classic Maple or sure. something. But, um, but for like a Classic Maple or something like that, I would have uh, just the XLR cable coming out the vent hole on the on the Rezo side head. But yeah, because um, you know I used to have just a regular mic stand and a mic in front of the kick, but the singer would always trip over it, spill something on it. It was just getting beat up so yeah uh, plus you you'll never have to worry about forgetting to bring that stand or bring that mic or bring that xlr cable or whatever what do you so yeah. what is your typical setup because i mean i think it's as you gig more you start to like kick snare for me it was kick snare tom floor the standard four piece set uh yep what's what's your standard setup obviously you have the roland but what do you use right my standard is the four piece setup and then uh, with the, the main band that I'm in now, the Boston Naturals, I have it because I'm triggering some, I start some songs with a, with a backing track sometimes uh, or a one-off sound effects here and there. So I need that. So I have that set up to the, to the left side of my hi-hat. Coming off that stand, I have a, um, like a timbali drum because mm. there's a few songs we do where I need those, that kind of sound. Yeah. Um, so I have that. It's like, I think it's a 10 inch. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, it's just that um, 15 inch hi hats, a couple of crashes. I got a great Istanbul 24 inch ride that can use sometimes it's just that if this like limited space, I'll just have that and, and a crash. Mm. Um, but that's really it. Some every once in a while, I'll bring a second floor, Tom. But it, it's it's very rare if I do that because it's unneeded. I don't really need it. Yeah. Um, a lot of stages aren't big enough or even if they are, it's just overkill. Yeah. Um, Back in the 90s in the original band, I used to have three across, two down or one down uh, and lots more cymbals. But that was the music kind of called for it. We were kind of like a power trio and sure. the more I could I could accent here and there, the different sounds I could get helped. Uh, but the bands I'm in now are mostly cover bands, um, the occasional original band. But I find sometimes just kick and snare. There's a lot of gigs where I'll play just kick, snare and maybe a floor tom. Um, yeah. just more groove groove oriented music yeah yeah it's for that it, it's when you're gigging a lot just to the point too of just hauling gear you know i don't have roadies so mike mangello has been hand hammering unique instruments for discerning artists of all styles for years out of a shop in south philadelphia on september 8th he'll be releasing his first two production model series of symbols the warm, shimmery workhorse series and the smooth, dark, semi-dry Ava Ray series will cover the modern gigging drummer in any situation from jazz to rock. Join Mike at Pocket Percussion in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania on September 8th from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. for a celebration of the series launch. Follow along on Instagram at Mangello Symbols or visit MangelloSymbols.com starting September 8th, 2022 to order. That's M-O-N-G-I-E-L-L-O Symbols.com. One thing which may be on your list that I'll just throw out there now, a fan, a fan for hot days. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very important. Yep. Yep. I, I do bring a fan, especially in the summer months. Uh, it helps. It actually helps. For a f couple years ago, I was experiencing uh, dehydration and then cramping in my fingers oh, yeah. and even in like my legs. And someone yep. said, obviously, drink water, hydrate more, stretch more, breathe. Breathing is important while you're playing. I never thought about it before, but sometimes if I'm playing in a song and it's I'm just grooving, I'll just say, hey, don't forget. And I take a lot of deep breaths. But the fan helps keep your body temperature down and that yep. can prevent dehydration as well. And the other big yep. thing was I thought at one point at my worst uh, cramping gig, I was playing in Boston at a big club it was toward the end of the night. Both hands started cramping. Fingers were collapsing inward. And then I was cramping in both legs. And Jeez. I was just shriveling. I felt like I was shriveling <laughs> yeah. up like a ball. I had all I could do to keep the beat going. And there's like 700 people all dancing. And I'm like, I, you can. the big rule is you can never stop once you yeah. start playing so i got through it but in between songs i'm literally bending my fingers back out and uh i i thought is this a career ending issue what's wrong with me i googled it i'm dehydrated but potassium kept on coming up so i started thinking like when was the last time i had a banana yeah and i started eating bananas every day and all of those cramping issues went away 
it just ha- and not only that i like jump out of bed in the morning i run up the stairs two at a time at the airport like it changed everything so bananas mm-hmm. i i make sure i pack like for gigs like food like having a cooler uh f- with some ice and pack bananas pack water pack gatorades power aids whatever uh, in making like a sandwich the one topic yeah. me and katie were talking about was not only having like a sandwich for the ride home um the way you make the sandwich let's just say it's a peanut butter and jelly right don't just put peanut butter on one half and then jelly on the other because then the bread gets soggy because you're not eating it for eight hours so i figured out or someone told me just line both both sides of the bread with peanut butter and then put the jelly in between so the jelly doesn't make the bread go (laughs) go soggy and it totally works right it totally works so then it's two in the morning you get in your car to drive home and you you have like a really good peanut butter jelly sandwich that you're psyched to eat um it's same thing with even like a turkey sandwich dude you put like the lettuce down first and then the mayo your bread doesn't get soggy interesting (laughs) little things like that but like or like cliff bars just little things like that where yes it just really pays snickers i love snicker bars yeah yeah just a quick little also nuts work because the big fear of all right, you, you got to the gig. Well, I played a gig up in Maine. It was a three and a half, four hour drive. And I was dry. I had to drive home that night cause for another gig down on the Cape. I, I, the big fear is falling asleep at the wheel, right? Let's face it. That could yep. easily happen. Totally. Um, I always, I always found if I had just a bag of, of salted peanuts of some kind, just to keep me eating for as long as I can. Cause I feel yes. like I, I don't think I've ever fallen asleep mid chew. I don't think that I don't I don't know if it's humanly is it, capable. Is it possible? I Maybe. I don't know. Could yeah. have you ever fallen asleep with food in your mouth? I don't know if anyone no. ever has. No, or you wake up like, what the <laughs> what was I yeah. eating? You still half eaten food in your mouth. It's yeah. never happened. No, total choking hazard. No, that's a exactly. good point. But these are like, I mean, it's almost sounds silly, but these are like things your mom would tell you. Like take a snack or like, you know, someone's mom. And I say this now as a dad with like young kids, it's like, I don't leave the house without snacks. Like I will not, mm-hmm. we, you know, I'm bringing the water bottles. I'm doing all that. And it's like, cause someone's going to be miserable. Same thing for adults. Um, yeah. Just take care of yourself. Even some beef jerky or something, you know, just, I love beef jerky, especially yeah. being a drummer. You've sweated it out for a couple hours and your body's craving salt. Right. Plus, I'm so I'm always starving after a gig. You just work up an appetite. Yeah. And the worst thing is, is like when you pull into that, you know, 24 hour convenience store somewhere and and it's actually closed. <laughs> That's a new pandemic thing. Where sometimes <laughs> yeah. it's like, well, we closed at midnight. It's like, wait a minute, you've been open 24 seven for like, you know, 30 years. Yeah. Um, and but that's the worst thing in the world is when you just don't have you're hungry and you have nothing to eat and you can't find anything. It's, it's yep. horrible. Yep. Um, that's yeah. a good one. Um, I will throw out too. just I remember uh, playing a gig years ago in college and I think I got a flat tire and it wasn't even like it popped. I think it just it had a slow leak checking your tires mm-hmm. and stuff like that kind of goes with your yep. car and, and you polishing your headlights and stuff. Um, yeah, but just, that's true. Uh, tire pressure. Really I have important. an air compressor where I will go around and, and check every maybe a couple of months just to make that's sure smart. I agree. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is I find that uh, like let's say a band calls you up and that you you got the gig they need a drummer they liked your website or whatever and, and they give you the gig I, there was a band I had never played with before and I've played with them now since many times but the very first gig with them that you know they said you know load in is at seven I, I'm there at six thirty mm-hmm. quarter of the latest right yep. get there early yeah um so and then always if it's like wait, let's say GPS says it's an hour away I always leave an hour and a half. Always, I'll, I love to allow, Same. if I can, like, right, a half an hour buffer in case you have yes. a flat tire, in case you hit traffic, in case anything happens. Um, yep. At least yep. you have a little bit of, of of wiggle room. And when you get there, load in, and then I offer to help everyone else load in. Um, I don't just do my own gear. Uh, and, yeah. then, and then the other big thing is uh, don't talk, don't gossip about other musicians. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, I was on a gig once and this guy was duh, 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 and, duh, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. and then you f- maybe find out who knows. We all know each other, you know, so maybe yeah. this band is friends with that band or something like that. That's, it doesn't go over well. Yeah. So uh, let everyone set up. We always have fun conversations after the gig, but everyone's got a job to do is get set up as quickly as possible to sound check and play. Don't be weird is another thing. And I don't know if how possible it is with some of us, but <laughs> I have learned that if you're just weird, and maybe you don't know if you're weird or not um 
if you put off a cool, easy going vibe and you know the you know the music, you've learned yeah. the material, uh, that goes a long way because the next morning they're gonna wake up and and think like, hey, that went really well. The drummer was great, he was on time, yeah. he helped with gear. Uh, he didn't gossip about anybody. He didn't complain about anything. Yeah. Uh, he played the music. He helped us load out. Yeah. Uh, he was his headlights early. were clean. He yeah. His <laughs> headlights were clean. Uh, <laughs> he had bananas for everybody. No. It's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like little yeah, it's so things true. like that. You're right. It, it's just a, yeah. the lasting impression. What's the first thing they're going to think about the next day when they think about the gig? Um, yeah. So that's what I. That's what I. I try to th imagine myself through their perspective of of meeting me yeah and you know i have yeah. done so I, I should say this like i've played hundreds of gigs in my life but in 20 basically right before the pandemic had a baby kind of started the podcast right around that time have had another kid so i have been out of the gigging world for about three three years ish now which i can't i'm going to get back to it obviously the it's just how the way it's worked out but a lot of experiences yep. i've had uh during that time though was doing some session work where i worked and uh, I, I used to do photo assisting, which there's a lot of parallels to, again, the creative world, where one thing I learned that I think is a parallel in that that photo assisting world, which would be carrying stuff, moving lights, doing all this stuff was don't like offer. And this this was big with session work with drumming. Don't offer too many opinions when they're not really they don't really want your opinion or like don't right. just talk for the sake of talking I feel like, yep. but don't not talk. That's kind of that weird thing of like, boy, this guy doesn't talk at all. It, like <laughs> that would be creepy, right? If you never said, yeah, it like yeah. you want it, you want to be engaged, but I don't know. You got to know your, know your place a little bit. Um, it's, yeah, it's an feel interesting, it out. feel it out. I feel agree. It out. Like if they, if they're all going to grab a drink and you, you partake, whether you drink alcohol or not, just grab a Coke or a water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like the camaraderie of it all. I mean, you are a band and, um, but yeah, I agree. I totally agree with that. Just uh, yeah. just join in. Be yeah. you're with them for that whole night. So yeah, for sure. Be present. Mm -hmm. And just while we're on that, I remember again being in that world of that, like, you know, a uh, production assistant and working in that again, not really drumming, but it sort of applies of like um, out of sight, out of mind. Once you start being out of their like their orbit, it really was mm -hmm. like uh, you just kind of like, well, they stopped calling. But it's like you just if you're if you're not there as much, it uh, it sort of goes away. So you got to be present and and around. And then social media helps with that a lot, too. So like yeah. for the band I'm in now, I do a lot of the social media stuff because I love shooting, you know, setting up a GoPro somewhere or my sure. or my phone or doing a live, you know, Instagram with a video. But and I'll always at least bring the GoPro if I'm subbing with a band and I'll ask them, hey, do you guys want me to turn on the GoPro? I won't just do it. I yeah. always ask first. That's true. Uh, and a lot of time, most of the time, they're like super excited about the fact that I'm going to capture video. And not only will I, I'll extract afterwards the next day or whatever, extract the audio from it, maybe even EQ it a little bit, sync it back up again, create like a cool minute long social media post for them, send it to them. Like, here you go. Like, here's a fun video. So yeah, I think that helps. And we all connect through social media. Having a social media presence works because then even if you're not playing with them, Every couple of weeks, every time you post, they'll see it. They'll like it. Yeah. You know, they, they still see you gigging. You're still around. You're still doing it. Um, For sure. That's a good way to keep, you know, that's a good hearts and minds technique. Yeah. 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 And I have written down a question to ask you about, uh, which you just basically touched on is, is like marketing yourself, like putting yourself out there too, because you, you said you play with a bunch of bands and, and really, I guess, just having a good online presence and uh, representing, you know, putting yourself out there in the best light is important. And not always having it be about yourself, if at all possible. In other words, I won't set up a camera where it's just you only see me playing and not the rest of the band. I, sure. I want to try to get the whole band, you know, yeah. uh, capture some fun moment. Or if something happens in the audience, uh, yeah. that that might make it more might get more views. You know, I yeah. mean, it, we all see drumming videos uh, if that's what you're doing. But it, it, I rather would select a fun moment at and during the night where you see the crowd really engaged it's kind of a you know a peak moment in the set and we're all sounding great and that's what i like to capture or at least yeah. put out there social media wise yeah yeah that, totally that to me, that's more fun way more fun all right so let's say you get a call from you know a local like cover band who needs you at a gig how do you stay up to date with what songs you need to be like learning how do you how do you keep up to date with what you need to know to be relevant 
so sometimes I'll get it won't be three days. Sometimes it'll be three hours. Yeah. And a lot of times, if that's the case, the band is not even expecting you to be on top of every note. But let's say it is three days or five days or whatever. A set list will get sent out and I'll go through it. I'll most of the time I'll know at least half, if not 75, 80 percent of the songs, the ones I don't know. Actually, what I will do is create probably like a Spotify playlist, even with uh, with the name of the band and all of the songs on their set list. And yeah. I'll listen to the ones, of course, that I don't know. Um, and that's how I'll learn. A lot of times, sometimes it's just actually on the way to the gig. I'll be playing the ones I don't know just to try to familiarize. Like, how do, how do they how do the songs start? Is it me that starts them? Those are yep. usually the notes, uh, the little notes totally. in, the, in the margins that I write, like, go oh, guitar start. So I don't have to worry about tempo even or anything like that. But if yeah. it's me starting it or we're all in, I got to make sure I got to remember that whatever the tempo is. And, and then there's always the tempo that the band prefers, too. That could be different from the original song. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we'll call out a song and I'll say, you know, what tempo do you guys like? And so usually someone will lean in and, and kind of count it off for me. But for the most part, that's how to, how it starts. If there's a break in the middle or what happens after the bridge, usually it's a breakdown or whatever, um, yeah. and then how it ends. And if it's a song that the original recording fades out, well then, you know, who knows? We're just going to wing it. Yeah, that's um, a good you'll point. You'll feel yeah. it, right? You'll look at the band, someone will cue you, you can feel it coming around and then you'll just end. A lot of times I'll start, if it's a type of riff that has sort of accents, I'll start hinting a few measures before where I feel like it might end as to certain hits. And that will actually clue in a lot of good musicians too uh, as to when we end, it'll be those same hits that I accented. You'll sure. they'll start to understand like they'll, yeah, I'm almost tele telegraphing it a little bit, but yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, learning the songs, I've always, for some reason, been lucky in that sense because I've had the ability to map my way through songs just by listening to them. I've actually gotten gigs uh, auditioning for bands that way where one of my first albums I bought was, when I was 10, 10 years old was Bruce, uh, Born to Run, Bruce Springsteen's album. And I used to listen to it religiously. I don't think I even had a drum set at the time and a practice pad. Uh, so fast forward, you know, I don't know, about 15, uh, 12 years ago or so, I, I auditioned for a, um, a soul band, like a Motown style band. And I got to the uh, audition. Now I haven't heard Born to Run in, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Uh, and that was the song they called out. And that's one of those songs where if you know it, you know it. If you don't, it's going to be very clear, especially sure. those hits after the bridge, you know? Yep. Dun, dun, uh, and, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> exactly yep. those. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, of course, I nailed it because for some reason, I can't remember some of the names of my neighbors I've lived on the same street with for 25 years, but I remember those hits <laughs> yeah. exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been lucky in that sense where I can, or I've taken gigs where I don't know the set list at all. There isn't one. It's just a band, a couple of guys that get up every night uh, and play and they need yeah. a drummer and it'll be like the theme to Happy Days. And I'm like, well, I just I watched that show religiously as a kid. It's like, yeah. here we go. One, but there's a lot of stops. Two, three o'clock are rocked. It's a lot yeah. of stops. So yeah. you yeah. have to just be able to turn on a dime, always watch, always be listening. Yes. Someone will cue you and they'll know like, hey, this drummer is the first time playing with us. And a lot of times they'll if something's coming up, they'll give you the look like, are you here yeah. we go? We're going to break here or whatever. Yep. So yep. You just their have eyes to are open present. super you, wide. <laughs> It, as yours should be as well, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, I had it's I had a, a couple. Thing. I had a couple uh, ones where it would be like, what is it? I love rock and roll, like Joan Jett, where there's like a yep. dun dun, and then it, at one point it dun 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 dun, it doubles up, and I was just like, oh, I screwed that. Oh up. yeah, you're right. I know exactly yeah. that part. Yep. Yeah. Or then the the weight um, by the band, which I love the band, but that we play that, that uh, song. And, 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 and I did one too early. And this is over. This isn't one gig. It was over a bunch of. Uh, You're right. There's one like chorus or section that goes on twice as long. Like you four put the load. Bars, put the load right on. Yeah. And then. Um, yep. Um, uh, here comes the sun one time at like a little wine bar. I was playing that. And I'd never. I listened to it all the time, but it was like all the breaks. The like. Da, da, do, 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 do. And I just totally yeah. was not yeah. again. I, I've listened to the song a thousand times, but that doesn't mean that you know how to play it. It's perfectly. still it's still tricky when that part comes around because I've had to play yeah. that song also. Yeah. And it's sometimes you just try to get lucky and you sort of flub your way through it. But yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah. they're usually uh, if, everything's usually fine. But but you remember the bad times. <laughs> you do. You do. And as glaring as they may seem on stage, no one in the audience ever no. picks up on it. No. They never do. No one they cares. Never do. No. Nope. <laughs> no one cares. Yeah. 
One other thing is just after the gig, the next day, if it's a brand new band, I always send a follow up eat text, usually just thanking them for the gig. Had a great time, period. Yeah, that's I think that's, you know, it's like looking forward to future gigs. That to me is perfect. Like no, one, yeah. you just got to do it. Is I, I don't know. It's that's I icing mean, on the cake. That is, yes, bands gigging, but that's sort of like uh, mature, like human interaction where you have a job interview, you should follow up, you get a right. gift, you exactly. should send a thank you note. Am I guilty of not sending thank you notes and all that stuff? Does my wife do it and I don't have any idea? Yes. But is it Same like, here. Uh, is it something you should do? Absolutely. Any other yeah. la- things you want to throw out there that, that are good to know? I would I would say this. Don't overplay. I would say this to anybody and everybody uh, at any time, especially with a new band that you're subbing with. Maybe it's a one and done. Who knows? But don't try to impress them by overplaying. It's not a drum solo for you. Just play to the music. It's how I got into the band I'm in now. Uh, when they had their previous drummer, who he'd see me at a show and he'd call me up to sit in every time. I'd play three or four songs and I just played the songs. Um, and I think after the first time I sat in with them, the bassist came up to me and said, you and I are going to share many stages together because he was looking Mm. for a drummer. And I, he's a a real, the real deal in terms of bassists. He's toured the world and elsewhere. So, um, yeah. And and I've been playing with them ever since, but that was probably one of the biggest lessons because I see it all the time. You see someone get called up to play, whether it's guitar, drums, whatever it is, or singing, and they just try to show off and do a giant solo thinking oh, I'm going to pre- impress all my friends who are here and the band itself. And it just never goes over well. But the, yeah. the guys who or the girls who just play the bare minimum and play to the music, they'll win every time. Yeah, yeah. that's, the, that's well, the biggest one. That kind of seems to go along with like, I feel like there's some certain like, um, like you said, bare minimum, like like being able to being a drummer, being able to play, playing to a metronome, having practiced in the background at, at home, you know, having good timing, sort of like a uh, like it's a it's assumed that you can do that, you know. Right. Now, what do you do if you totally flub up a gig? You just it did not go well. Everything's been screwed up. You're not going to get the gig again. You've just it was a bad thing. I mean, everyone's had that at some situation where something's happened. How do you recover from something like that? I don't know if you can. Um, <laughs> just move on. Just I, You might just have to move on. If it was that bad, I'm trying to think like what could cause that. I mean, I, other uh, probably it's just not knowing any of the songs, especially if you've had a week or two or more to yeah. learn them and just blowing it tempo wise, volume wise. That's another thing. Yeah. Don't just start bashing really loudly. Learn how to play quietly. Yeah. I often practice as if there's a baby sleeping next to me. Like I, that's a really hard thing to do. Yeah, I was at a gig with the the Motown band. They have a horn section. We had to play somewhere where they kept on complaining about the volume. Keep it down. And I remember how difficult it was to play quietly. And I remember the horn section uh, during break. They were like dripping with sweat because for them, they, I didn't even realize this. They said it's ten times harder for us to play quiet. It's more oh, effort, wow. you know, yeah, so you're trying to blow. You have to blow a certain amount, but then you have to hold it back at the same time and choke it. So um, that ability is good. But in, if you really blow the gig, though, getting back to your actual question, I, I think you actually just apologize. I don't know if you'd ever recover from it. I don't think it's recoverable sure. uh, if, if you were given the chance. If, if it was one of those situations where they called you an hour or two, like we're really in a jam, just show up. And you didn't know the material. I think it would, they'd be more understanding um, and pre- probably ultimately even appreciative that you even attempted. A lot of drummers yeah. would say, no, I, if I don't know the material, I don't even want to risk embarrassing myself. But yeah, I, I, I was at a gig once where another drummer was playing at a band and he was 10 times louder than the band. And it was everyone in the audience was just mortified. We were all just. And I never forget it. He was uh, after the gig, he was breaking down. I know that band never called him again. His uh, the speeder shaft on his kick pedal was bent severely. Man. That's how yeah. hard he hit. I mean, I've seen beater shafts snap in two. I've never seen them bend. Um, and it was in a tough room with bad acoustics. It was painful. It's like a lack of awareness almost. Like, I guess sometimes yep. being aware of the situation will help you recover mid failure of like yep. what's going on to kind of course correct and uh, get your and way it's hard through if it. You don't have the ability. It's, I don't know how anyone would teach it. I, you just have to be, 
you just have to right being aware being present listening to what where you are in the mix volume wise especially if you aren't mic'd you don't have an engineer um yeah you just got to be present you really do and just got to try your best and if you screw up i mean we all screw up i don't think there's ever been a gig where someone didn't hit a wrong note or miss a key yep. change or something like that that's that stuff just happens and i used to have the biggest fear of dropping a stick that used to be my biggest fear and now i've gotten to that point where i actually don't mind it i don't fear it at all because it's more about the recovery right? yes and it's how you recover and then you eventually the more you play the the better you get at having your stick bag right next to you hanging off your floor tom that's a must have although i made the uh, a mistake last month at a gig we had a setup real quick we had two or three gigs that day and this uh, i think it was the first or second song I'm, my i can feel the stick breaking you know when it gets all like vibration oh, yeah. in, yes. your, in your hand <laughs> and i just tossed it to grab another stick and i hadn't put my drum bag on my floor tom yet and the, the drum bag was like way off to the side and i realized <laughs> I got one stick now and I still got to get through half a song and I need oh, both boy. sticks. So I literally had to almost completely stop playing to g come off the throne and grab the stick that I threw and play with a broken stick. But yeah. um, that, that was, a that was even, you know, after all these years and all these gigs, like something like that can happen, but it, it's the band I play with regularly and they barely even cared. Um, no, no people, but you yeah, care, you care about things more than anyone else. Like you said, with the gig and you go, God, that was terrible. And your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, it's like, yeah, it was, it was good. It's fine. Like people are talking yeah. <laughs> like no one's yeah. that invested. I mean, people do listen closely, but you know what I mean? You, you're your biggest self, you know, exactly. critic. Yeah. A little yeah. details, but yeah, I don't, I don't think if you really screwed up, I, you just have to cut your losses. I, I do want to say too, though, like as we wrap up here, you do a lot of work with like Adobe. I mean, outside of the drum stuff, which we've just had an awesome conversation about, it's pretty cool what you do, man. You've got a really neat background. So, so real quick, cause I know probably a lot of the people who listen use Adobe products and all this stuff. What do you do with Adobe? So I'm a member of uh, what's called the ACP program uh, or community uh, professionals program. Um, so what that means is I'm always on their community forums helping out. I've also been on the, so I've been using Animate, uh, their animation program, flagship animation program, which we used to be Flash back in the day. So I've been using this program for a lot because back when we were doing TV shows, we were using an, uh, a DOS based program called Animator Pro by Autodesk. And then it was, you know, all of a sudden Windows 95 and DOS was going away and Autodesk wasn't supporting their program anymore, 2D animation program. And I was tasked with finding new animation software and I just found Flash. Flash 4 came out. The internet was exploding with all this crazy content. And I was just right there on the front lines of it all and wasn't even using it for the web. Didn't even know about the web side of things and uh, saw how people were using it. We even got a, um, a deal with a website at the time. It might even still be around called Shockwave, which had all these Flash games and stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, we yeah. were animating for TV and playing games on Shockwave uh during breaks or whatever or when we should have been working and then someone came in and said hey we got a deal with shockwave to do a whole animated series and the task was create a two-minute episode um a two-minute episode with audio animation everything with a preloader because back in the day it was like what 56.6k and 28.8k modems and whatever we all had to be self-contained in this one file. It couldn't be any bigger than a megabyte. It had to have a preloader and a game during the preloader. And they said to looked at me and said, figure it out. And you have two weeks to do the first episode. So it's like, oh, my God. So <laughs> oh my anyway, God. long story short, that's how I got introduced to the whole world of, of Adobe. Well, at the time, it was Macromedia that owned uh, Flash, but they got bought mm -hmm. by Adobe. So that's how I got it more into the whole Adobe world. We were already using programs like Photoshop in conjunction with Flash. Um, and like I said, we had avid media composers and stuff, but when I went out and branched out on my own, it was more th programs like, um, Premiere Pro and trying to think mm. what else. So for now, yeah. like, yeah, I'm, I'm just being still involved with Adobe. I, I work with the engineering team. I've been on their pre-release for as long as I can remember, but I'm friends with the engineering team out in India. And a lot of times they'll ask me for. Uh, sample files that actually ship with the program. So like you install Animate now and you just hit the start screen along the bottom are a bunch of thumbnails. You can double click and they open up actual source files of animations. It's me huh. and my friend Joseph LeBrock. He's authored a lot of them as well. Wow. Yeah. And so then I get invited to speak at Adobe Max conferences. I've been, you know, almost all over the world speaking at flash based conferences, whether it's like Amsterdam or San Francisco or just a whole again, a whole other layer uh, to the onion that is my career. Um, and yeah. yeah, I'll be going out back to the first 
post-pandemic in-person Max, which is out in LA in October, and finally getting to do a session again. But uh, just amazing experiences. Like you get up, and I never think like I'm doing anything special. For the most part, I'm animating silly little characters or animals or whatever, and then all of a sudden I'm flown across to you know uh, the UK, Brighton Beach, UK, because there's a conference there, to, and they want me to speak for an hour and like show them how I made a monkey you know trapeze across the screen. And I'm like, really? Yeah. That's just that's, <laughs> seriously. You're gonna pay for my flight, hotel, bring me over. So yeah, in this um, this October, I'm going out to LA to talk for one hour, and I'll be there all week. And uh, to, well, I'm actually gonna wow. I'm be TAing, uh, it, helping teach a couple other labs. But for the most part, my only requirement is to speak for an hour and show them how to take uh, an illustration done in a different program, whether it's an iPad program or a Photoshop or Illustrator, and bring it into Animate and apply like the cool rigging bone tool and then start creating armatures and bringing it to life. And it's not like advanced frame by frame, purist, you know, animation type stuff that not a lot of people yeah. do. This is more kind of like animation for the for everyone and anybody who's never even dabbled sure. in animation before, because that was my story. I never animated before. I never took a course. Um, and so when I was hired to work on those shows uh, early on in my career, it, they hired me just because I could draw. And I had a sense of timing, we found out, because I could video edit. But it was really about just composing shots and stories over time, shot for shot, and just having that sensibility. So my wife hates watching movies with me because I always point out inconsistencies because they're so glaring to me. <laughs> but uh, I'm like, yeah. rewind it. You missed it. Her watch is on the other wrist. You know, like stuff like that. But <laughs> yeah, or I do that where I'm like, that was ADR. <laughs> like, there's no way that was that right. was actually recorded live. Right. Like, that's not how that sounds. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's right. Awesome, when you hear man. when you hear an overdub, it's, it's yeah, I totally get it. It's completely it, obvious. It's clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, what all of this is just I love Adobe stuff. I've given Adobe a lot of money over the years after once it switched to subscription after uh, CS6. But yeah. um, I'm 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 happy to be updated and all that stuff. But I think the takeaway from this kind of end of the conversation is like you can do multiple creative things. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can be a drummer and really focus on that, but also do this kind of other stuff. Or if that's not really a p possible for you, you can be a drummer and you can also like work at an office. You can right. do two things. You right. know, it's definitely possible. I mean, it gets busy, but uh, but it's good. And I love when the worlds collide in the sense where I did a, uh, a collaboration during the pandemic with a whole bunch of musicians. And then it did all the video editing, the mixing, all that. But then I did a layer of animation over it to just because I can. Um, yeah. You know, little things like not rotoscoping so much, but just like mm -hmm. hand-drawn animations to complement the videos that were taking place under it. So yeah, I don't know. Sure. Uh, if I can do it, I will. I think if I come up with an idea, if it hits me, then I almost have to act upon it and, and execute yeah. it. But yeah I, yeah, I feel lucky that I get to do both. That's awesome, man. Well, um, Chris has been kind enough to stick around and do a little bonus episode today. Uh, he came up with a really cool idea. Uh, we're going to talk about things that have happened on gigs with him that are like you could never plan <laughs> like things that come out of nowhere that are a total surprise um, because that's how the world works. Not everything is, oh, I broke my bass drum pedal. I have an extra bass drum pedal. Clip it on and I'm good to go. So there's a lot of surprises out there. Um, so if you want to hear that, go to uh, drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a Patreon link. Click it two bucks a month and up. And uh, you can now get your name for 10 bucks, 15 bucks um, at the end of the YouTube videos, which is a cool way to kind of uh, everyone who's done it so far has done it to promote a shop or a drum or John, like John to Christopher promotes his podcast. Um, so cool, kind of cheap way to promote what you got going on. Um, but anyway, Chris, this has been awesome, man. Personally, I think this is really cool because I grew up loving the show Home Movies. And now to just find out five minutes before we record <laughs> that you worked on, you were art director for Home Movies and you had listened to my show. It's like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> like pretty <laughs> wild, man. You never know what's going to happen. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being here. Um, well, before we leave, is there anywhere that people can find you? You want to direct them to your social media website, anything like that? Thank you. Sure. Uh, if you search Boston Drummer on Instagram, you'll find me. Um, my animation site is keyframer.com, and that's probably plenty. But yeah, thank you. Sure. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Chris. This is really cool. Thank you for having me. This was fun.